then it might count for James. But, you know, if somebody's, you know, token up on Friday night and it's like, dude, we're going to make this feeling happen, happen, James would say, well, you know, that doesn't really count because it doesn't have this sensation of kind of something that comes on from the outside. Now, it could be, I could be wrong on this. We could debate about that, this, but that's what's kind of neat about James's four characteristics. And you guys did a lot of debating. Most of you had a problem with either that noetic element or that transient element uh, that I've just talked about. Um, so let me kind of conclude here by saying for William James, the religious experience was important because he was living in that time, like Max Weber was, where thinkers were becoming concerned that like scientific biological determinism, arguments about uh, rationality and science leading the way and that being the only thing that we need nowadays. He was concerned, James was, that 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 was doing something to humans and societies that was problematic, that that scientific thought couldn't have all the answers for how life was lived. And so he saw religious experiences as being very important because they were these very, they were an individual and direct way to experience the divine and the transcendent. So for James, you didn't need somebody else to mediate it. You didn't need somebody to tell you about a religious experience. And you didn't need a, a kind of moralistic group to tell you. No, instead, you yourself could conceivably have this own experience that would inspire uh, a certain style of life. And so in that, he saw them as, as this really important to society because they allow individuals to overcome themselves uh, and to, to find what's best for themselves. Uh, in living their life. Now let me just say a few words here um, about other sociological pro approaches to dealing with religious experience. Um, a classic one, of course, uh, is Max Weber, who we've talked about many times before. Uh, and I'll just mention here that as we talked about, he one of the axes of the way he thought about religious ideas, if you remember, was this distinction between uh, mystic and ascetic. So for Max Weber, he actually he actually wants to um, say, well, religious experience is one way of being religious, but you can also be ascetic. So you can actually also be kind of like a monk, where instead of like kind of these transcendent uh, transcendent escapist experiences, no, instead your life is much more concrete, and it's it's in the day to day of washing the table or or writing with the pen or or sewing the, the blanket. By the way, that's the universal sign for sewing. Um, so he, he Weber um, actually wants to make a distinction and say that religious experience isn't this universal element of religion. No, that it's actually one way of being religious. And Weber argues that way, uh, th and this is kind of ironic, because he has a similar background to uh, James in saying, in being worried about kind of the rationalization of modernity. And so what he sees in some ways, this ascetic way of being religious is a very modern way of being religious. And, and he's somewhat intrigued by this kind of mystical way of being religious. And he has hope, and this is an important term for, for, uh, for Weber, he has hope in what he calls charismatic individuals. Now charismatic individuals, uh, oftentimes are mystical in the sense of, of having kind of these visions or these about what the world and what religion should be like. Um, so for Weber, religious experience for him is important because for these charismatic individuals, they're able to break through society and come up with new religious visions, new religious ideas that have the possibility to re renew society and bring kind of a religious vision um, back into the social realm, especially for Weber writing in an era where, remember, he thought we were all trapped in the iron cage of rationality. So he, he, he puts something in this ability of, of, of individuals to have religious experience and kind of to bring the, the results of that into the social world. Um, and then finally, let me close by saying that Zuckerman has an interesting, in his chapter when he talks about time and place, you know, Zuckerman poses interesting questions such as, why is it that a person say, um, you know, because I, I study, I study uh, Mexico on the border, why is it that somebody in Mexico in, in the 1600s, when they had a religious experience, reported seeing uh, this person that they called the Virgin Mary of Guadalupe, why did they have that 
as a religious experience instead of having Buddha as a religious experience. And what Zuckerman is arguing in his chapter is saying, well, it's not that they didn't have a religious experience, but the, the quality and the content and the substance of, their, of a religious experience has everything to do with time and place. So the exact same person in 1600s Japan might have had an image of the Buddha come to them with a, with a more Buddhist type of teaching versus the Virgin of Guadalupe religious experience and the teaching that evolves out of that and is connected with the Catholic Church uh, in, in uh, Mexico and Central America. So these are important ways of saying that uh, the, the nature of religious experience um, or the content of religious experience has everything to do uh, with time and place. So I'm going to leave it for that for now and it's a segue really to the next lecture which talks about cults and church and sex, S-E-C-T-S, -E which at some level uh, are, are partially have to do with these religious experiences and ideas getting translated into action, getting translated into actual religious groups. And our question for the next question for the next lecture is why do religious groups look the way they do? Okay, thanks. Uh, let me know if you have questions. Bye.